Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm continuing my lecture series into ethnicity, theories of ethnicity and nationalism, and we are on section 1.4. You can get the notes by clicking the link in the description field. It'll take you to the PDF, download the PDF, use it to supplement your reading, and let's begin with section 1.4. So this is theories. And this is section 1.4. Okay. So um, again, the same the same uh, book, American Ethnicity: the, the Dynamics and Consequences of Discrimination. And we're going to talk today about the four stages of assimilation. Most of this section, the vast majority of this section, is on the concept of assimilation. And we're going to be looking at Robert Park's four stages of assimilation. So let's begin with that. Okay. So um, contact with diverse ethnic groups as the condition for competition. Contact as the condition for competition. So when we talk about assimilation, we need to know that it's rooted in com competition. Need for political representation, jobs, resources, etc. fuels inter-ethnic competition, which can either be positive, constructive, or negative, destructive. The idea is, in terms of our um, ethnic or inter-ethnic interactions within, specifically, the United States of America, basically anywhere in the globe, if we're talking about uh, dispersion of ethnic populations. Obviously, there's going to be inter-ethnic competition for whatever resources, jobs, positions, opportunities that exist. These opportunities, however, and this is what's important, it's not said here, these opportunities assume that they're open. The assumption is that these opportunities are open to every member of the population, irrespective of ethnical affiliation. The idea is, if you have an opportunity and that opportunity is equal access, hence equal access opportunity, then there's going to be a healthy, a healthy, constructive relationship, right? This competition is going to be constructive rather than destructive, right? The question is why? We have constructive relationships in terms of inter-ethnic competition because, I, and I, I, st I just realized, I, like, I just started and it's a little deeper. Um, You'll have to forgive me as we progress through the lecture series. Um, each Since I'm building on existing knowledge, I'm going to assume that you have the existing knowledge, so there'll be less sort of ghetto philosophy and more sort of just jumping right into the jargon. But the idea should make sense, right? If we have equal access opportunity, everyone in the population, irrespective of ethnical affiliation, has equal access to opportunities, then the competition that arises as a consequence of that equal access is going to be constructive, right? So that constructive competition, T-I-V-E, constructive competition is a consequence of equal access equal access opportunities, right? So constructive competition um, is itself a consequence of equal access opportunity. Since everyone in the population, irrespective of ethnical identity, has access to opportunity, the competition for those selected, selective pos positions are going to be, it's going to be constructive. It becomes destructive, right? Um, it's destructive and that is constructive competition, destructive competition, is itself a uh, uh, C, is itself a consequence of, rather than being equal access, it's going to be limited access, right? Limited access opportunity. Right? 
So it becomes destructive when it's limited. If I've or, or limited slash reserved, if I have certain social functionalities, certain job opportunities reserved for members of a specific ethnical population, then you can recognize that it, there really is no competition. There really isn't any competition because competition presupposes equal footing in some sense. Not always, but in this sense, it presupposes some degree of equal footing. If there's absolutely no way that I can occupy that position, if there's absolutely no way in which I can earn a right to be considered for that position, much less occupy it, then there isn't a competitive edge between those who have this position or positionality reserved for them and those who don't. What ends up happening is, as we said in the last series, there's a sense in which privilege is then justified, right? The privilege of having access is justified and is justified on ethnical terms. It's justified because of kinship, because of race. It's justified because of a shared ethnical characteristic, as arbitrary as that is, with the ruling elite. In terms of the destructive nature of this, it then legitimizes, it then legitimizes the dehumanization of those who don't have the opportunity, it legitimizes the exploitation, the marginalization, and so on and so on and so on, right? So that members of the population, we call them in genocide studies, targeted groups, right? Members of this targeted ethnical population, if we're not talking about their extermination or their forced migration, we're just talking about um, deselecting, deselecting them for consideration, such that consideration for any economic opportunity has already been reserved for members of ethnical group X. And so far as they've been deselected, their deselection from consideration necessitates, this is important, right? Their deselection from consideration necessitates their dehumanization. It necessitates their marginalization. It necessitates their exclusion, right? By default. So the idea is if individuals of an ethnical population have been deselected, then those, those consequences must unfold, must arise. As we said before, in terms of policy, it doesn't have to be the case that this is codified in law, that this is codified in policy. No one's saying that. What's being said is insofar as we collectively acknowledge that there isn't any representation within the business community, within the political establishment, within intelligentsia as the big three, from members of a marginalized community, the fact of their underrepresentation or non-representation is it necessitates exclusion. Their voices can't be heard. So in my race, I'm not going to do this in this series, but just to give you some context, in my race um, in my race and racism in America lecture series, um, I'm going to discuss precisely that, sort of the initial underrepresentation of African American narrative within the canon of the American narrative. Right? There was a that that didn't exist for a while. Abolitionists started to introduce that. And then I, I just found out that Dubois likes liked his name to be pronounced Du Bois. So I'm gonna pronounce it I was reading something, maybe my wife told me that. So I'm not gonna pronounce it Dubois, I'm gonna pronounce it Du Bois. Du Bois and others um, let the American population know that African Americans had something to be included. But in order to have that voice included, you have to have physical representation. You have to have the black professor who's ghetto. right? If you don't have the black professor who's ghetto, um, then you're not possibly going to be able to understand this positionality. right? There's a deeper concept, I don't want to get into it now, but this intersectionality of identity. right? My identity is intersectioned with many other aspects of culture and belief and practice, and without that physical representation, you willfully marginalize and exclude. So, in terms of the destructive element, you are twofold, twofold, undermining the population. You're undermining the marginalized population from representation, and you're undermining the privileged population from epistemic accessibility to. So I'll say that again, right? Insofar as we institute these um, discriminatory practices in terms of competition, competition gone bad, we undermine 
representation from members of the marginalized community, meaning there is no representation of marginalized narratives, voice, in the intelligentsia, the business class, the political class. So that suppresses and marginalizes those who are already marginalized, right? For those of the privileged class, especially if it's an ethnical class, privileged ethnical class, those of the privileged ethnical class don't have epistemic access, knowledge access, to those narratives and those stories. You can't create conditions for empathy. You can't create conditions for understanding. There's a huge, huge discourse, which I'm not going to get into now, which pertains to the master-slave dialectic. And the master-slave dialectic can basically be consolidated into the fact that the slave has epistemic advantage over the master class. And that's a problem, right? This is sort of a warning. In order to make epistemic footing equal, there needs to be representation. Now, granted, the volley is that representation is token and it benefits individuals and not collectives. There's a problem. There's a huge sort of back and forth volleying throughout the tradition, but I don't want to get into all of that now. That would just take us too deep. So the idea is the first stage, um, the first stage of assimilation uh, is competition, and that competition can either be constructive or destructive. What we're looking for is constructive competition, but constructive competition presupposes equal accessibility to opportunity. Where equal, ac where equal accessibility to opportunity does not exist, you do not have fair competition. There's a disadvantage. It's destructive. So just one quick tangent before, it's actually not tangential at all. One quick addendum to this point, um, Jonathan Kozel, I think I, I might talk about, if I don't talk about Kozel in this lecture series, again, it's in my race, I'm going to stop saying that because it's sort of intertwined. Um, Kozel talks, American um, social theorist, one of the best, talks about segregation within American school systems. I've done a lecture series on Kozel, so you can just type his name in, K-O-Z-O-L, into my search box and watch whatever videos I have up. Um, accessibility, education, educational accessibility, according to Kozel, isn't fair. There isn't an equal opportunity because educational accessibility in the United States is tied to the amount of property tax that the community contributes to the local education, the, the local, local educational system, the local school system, district system. Obviously, if you live in a more impoverished neighborhood, the consolidated property taxes are going to be significantly less than if you live in an affluent neighborhood where the consolidated property taxes are substantially more. Thus, those who live in a particular, irrespective of race per, per se, um, but including race, those who live in a more affluent community have better resources. Those who live in a less affluent community have less economic resources and thus less educational opportunities, right? I'm still using books. They're using you know, iPhones and Macs and iPads in their classrooms. We both have to go into the job market and compete. Who you think is going to have an advantage? Those who had better economic resources. So the, the resolve to that might be sort of the consolidation of economic resources and the equal appropriation. But of course, in the United States, as soon as you say that, everybody cries foul, cries at socialism. I'm not going to get into that discussion now. I'm not really concerned with it. I just wanted to contextualize it so that you have a better understanding. If you do have an understanding, I've done my job. So that's number one. Number two, number two is accommodation. Accommodation, um, in terms of accommodation, in terms of accommodation, migrated inter-ethnic populations change and adapt to their new environment. Migrated inter-ethnic populations change and adapt to their new environment. So that the idea is we have um, an ethnic population that is migrating into a new population. So we'll say it like this is X, this is Y. And the whole idea of assimilation is that there's a transformation. There's a change. I'm less what I used to be and more what I'm becoming. Right? I'm less, so for me I was born in Jamaica, moved to the United States, right? So just so that you can sort of see this now. So, this is America, 
This is Jamaica. Moved from Jamaica, came to the United States of America. And this idea of inter-ethnic populations change and adapt to their new environment, this is the sort of X, fill in the black, blank, um, I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. So this would be the Americanization, right? It would be to, to be Americanized. And in many ethnical populations, this, this ization, right, this nationalization, if you will, this nationalization of identity as a consequence of accommodation um, is, is seen pejoratively. Right? You always you become Americanized, I, I, at least in Jamaican terms. I don't know what it might be for other cultures. It's negative, right, to say that, well, you're less Jamaican now. You're not a real Jamaican, despite the fact that I was born there. Right? Oh, if you don't speak this way, and if you weren't, you didn't go to primary school there, then you're not really Jamaican. You're, you're less Jamaican. The problem with this, however, is that then others of the host nation will say, well, you're not really American either, right? You were naturalized. You weren't born here. So Jamaicans don't really, and this is the problem of um, migrant populations, is that even no matter how much social status you attain or how much economic wealth you attain or what have you, there's a sense of displacement. Right? Those of the community for which I was born don't consider me um, don't consider me a member of the national identity, right? Despite the fact that that's where I was born, those of the host community don't consider me um, an, a legitimate sort of a, a legitimate participant in national identity. And the best that you can get out of this is being Americanized, right? And that's problematic, right? Or, or whatever the nation is iced, right? The nationalization of identity, which is to be technical, right? The nationalization of identity is typically, is typically cast for those who have migrated pejoratively, as a pejorative fact, right? So you've become Americanized. The problem with that is that, well, no, I haven't been Americanized. I am an American, right? That's, it's not that I've been Americanized. No, I'm not acting American, I am American. So that this attempt to accommodate is an identity change. This tension is an identity change. It's not difficult for me because I left Jamaica when I was a child. I was three years old. You can imagine, however, somebody leaves their host nation, their, their, their motherland, their fatherland, you know, in their 20s, when they were entrenched in the identity of the nation and they come to, let's say, the United States of America. It could be very, very, very difficult to learn to accommodate his or her culture, his or her practice, language to the identity of the United States, which is, you know, almost limitlessly inclusive, right? The United States culture, aside from anything else, it's very, very inclusive. Um, and as a person who lives here, I'm letting you know that it is, right? It's not a myth. It is very inclusive. The culture is very inclusive. So, um, the ability to change and adapt to new environments in terms of assimilation is a very complex intrapersonal. That's within the personal, right? Intrapersonal. Right? That's. It's a very, very complex intrapersonal experience. And a lot of good qualitative research would look into the difficulties um, in the means of facilitating some of those difficulties that uh, migrant populations and migrant communities experience. For me, it was easy because dot, 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 dot. For me, nationalization of identity was really difficult because dot, dot, dot. For me, specifically, and just moving on after this, um, the nationalization of my identity was, and you can see how we're moving slowly from ethnicity to nationality. But for me, the nationalization of my identity was very, very easy because, I mean, I spent three years in Jamaica. I didn't even acquire sort of the Jamaican patois. I understand it, but I, I never acquired it. No part of my identity, aside from the fact that I was born in Jamaica, is Jamaican. None of it is. My identity is an American. Um, I identify myself as American, so I wouldn't say that I've been nationalized. The nationalization of my identity has been socialized, right? I've been socialized to be American because I grew up in the United States since I was a child, right? So, and we'll talk about the relationship between socialization and nationalization 
um, later, but I, my identity became nationalized through the process of socialization, right? and I'll talk about that again uh, later. So top of page nine, stabilization, so that was two. Number three is the stabilization. Stabilization. Cohabitation between migrant ethnic populations under the auspice of nationalism. I'll say that again. Cohabitation between migrated ethnic populations under the auspice of nationalism. And this is the ideal. So you would have sort of USA, then you would have sort of, let's just say, uh, uh, no, I want to use specific ethnical, not just black. So let's just say uh, Jamaican. There's a huge Jamaican community in South Florida, and there's a huge Cuban community in South Florida, right? So the Jamaican community, the Cuban community, and the relations between Jamaicans and Cubans are actually really good, right? Jamaican people are... <laughs> this is a generalization because not all Jamaican people are. Jamaican people are pretty much just sort of laid back uh, people. Not all the time, but that's the stereotype that we have, right? It's all about ganja and Bob Marley and, and good vibes. <laughs> there is some truth to that. Um, the, I can say that because I am Jamaican. Uh, but the idea is, in terms of the relationship, right? national identity is facilitated by, first, the recognition of this interchange, this interplay, this inter-ethnic um, participation. So cohabitation between migrated ethnic populations, cohabitation, so this would be cohabitation between inter-ethnic um, migrated populations under the auspice of nationalism is facilitated by our socialization. So the question now, now I'm going to get into it, the question then becomes what is this process of socialization, right? First, so two questions we have to answer. What is the, and I'm not going to give you the full explanation, right? What is the process of our, whoever our is, and our in this sense is going to be American. Um, what is the process of our socialization? And then the next question is going to be, how does our socialization contribute so two questions one what is the process of our socialization two how does our socialization contribute to national identity very important can't answer the second without first answering the first and I can't go into the, the full account of, of the first, but I'll give the key points um, so that we can have an understanding of sort of this element of stabilization. The author talked about this, and I know this, I know this level well. Um, the stabilization is a stabilization of inter-ethnic relations. Right? There has to be, this is absolutely key, there has to be, for us to have a national identity, a stabilized, sovereign national identity. There has to be some stabilized, there's going to be conflict, of course, no one's saying that this is going to be kumbaya, everybody's roasting marshmallows, but there has to be stabilized inter-ethnic, within the context of ethnicity, there has to be stabilized inter-ethnic relations in order for us to have any national identity. You can't have national identity if you have, or your national identity is going to be com consumed by conflict. Your national identity is going to become conflictual itself if you have not yet stabilized inter-ethnic relationships. Right? We transform the nature of our national identity through the stabilization of inter-ethnic relations. How do we do that? We do that through the process, if you do it well, justly, not unjustly, through the process of um, socialization. So what is the process of socialization? I'm going to give just a few Some of the key aspects of the process of socialization. Again, I don't in any sense assume this to be exhaustive, 
but these are the, the, the absolutely critical elements to our sociali socialization. The, I would argue, this is probably debatable, but I would argue, what's not debatable is that it's a necessary condition. Um, I'm not sure if it's the most significant necessary condition, that might be debatable, but I would say that it is the most significant. Um, the process of our socialization, absolutely integral, is what we're doing right now. The process of our socialization is rooted in education, irrespective of where you live in the world. Now, if you're optimistic about this, you look at education as a vehicle for inclusion, education as a vehicle for upward mobilization, assuming a capitalist market economy, right? Education as, and that's key, right? Assuming a market is, uh, uh, a capitalist market economy, education becomes a vehicle for upward mobilization. If you live in a socialist market economy, that's a different story. I'm not going to get into that. But overwhelmingly, since, you know, a significant, uh, overwhelmingly significant portion of the world post post Cold War era, you know, as capitalists, the market globally functions globally as capitalists, education is a vehicle for upward mobilization. There's no question. There's a direct correlation to that. The more education you have, the more money you make, the more education you have, the more stable economically you exist and blah, 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 blah. So if you look at education in that sense, there's some benefit, right? We are socialized into what? We are socialized into um, to be honest with you, a capitalist market economy. That's one thing. That's the first part. If you look at it in a pejorative sense, if you're against that belief, right, if you think socialization and education is something that's negative, then you look at education as being the primary mode for indoctrination. I tend to believe a little bit of both. I, I do believe that education is if not the most powerful, I think personally, I mean, my own bias, I, I almost never do this, but I'll do this now. My own bias is I believe education is absolutely critical to upward mobilization, but not the only thing. You can make tons and tons of money without having education, but that's the exception. The norm is for the overwhelming majority of the people, there's a direct correlation. Of course, the people who might become 1% might not have um, some do, some don't, might not need to have as much education as others, but I'm talking about the mass. There is another aspect, however, of education where it is indoctrination. I do believe in certain ideological, I am ideologically predisposed to XYZ, that I would never reveal, but I am ideologically predisposed to these systems of belief. I, I do believe in these structures of power and these elements of resistance, and as such, um, Though I don't do this in my lecture series because my lectures are free of bias in my private writings and in my publications. I mean, obviously in my publications, that's where you get to see what I believe in. In my lectures, it's different because this is not the place for it. But in my, in my writings that, that have my name to it, I'm going to say what it is that I feel, what it is that I believe in. I'm going to defend my position. Education is a process of our socialization. Why? One of the key elements, aside from sort of the capitalist bit in education, is that education instills value, right? This is a huge debate now in the States because um, there's this new move, and I'm going to get into this. Those of you who are teachers know this. Um, common core assessments are going to be huge. As soon as I say this, it dates the video, and I don't like doing that, but I just want to situate this. Those in the States who, who know about sort of this move away from the old paradigm, educational, to this new educational paradigm, Part of that educational paradigm includes value, um, which is really difficult because parents don't want the educational system teaching their kids about value. But you can talk about value without it being religiously affiliated. We can talk about the value of empathy and sympathy. We can talk about the value of inclusion in terms of Holocaust studies. We can talk about the value of recognition, of humanization, the value of, of um, social participation and social activity. We can talk about that and it's within education that we learn this. One of the key elements, just and I'll move on this in terms of socialization, is I think it's I think it's a law probably, at least in the state of Florida, that sometime between K through twelve, I mean I think the, the the parents can say they don't want their kid to be exposed to it, but you have to have like sex ed. <clears throat> so you know, I get the form, hey, we're gonna teach your kids about safe sex and sex education. I have no problem with that. My kids go to school, 
the school system teaches them about sex education. Why? Because um, sex education is important for having a healthy society. Um, some parents might not feel comfortable discussing that with their children, and the state assumes the responsibility, if you really think about this, right, the state assumes the responsibility for educating your kids about having sex. And this is education of your children, not your adults, education of kids about having safe sex. Does that condone sex? Absolutely not. There's some sort of marginalized debate about this. I don't think that this should even be a debate, but, you know, that's my own bias. But the state recognizes in terms of minimizing disease, in terms of health, in terms of unwanted pregnancies, educating and socializing our children um, about safe sex is part of the socialization process. You can opt out of it, but it's part of the socialization process. How is that socialization process implemented? Through education. Okay, so enough of that. Um, so the process of socialization is deeply, deeply, deeply wedded to education. Basically K through 12 sort of state education. Um, in terms of stabilizing the potential for inter-ethnic conflict, another key element, and again I'm not going to go through all of this, another key element of our process of socialization, of course, assuming a capitalist market economy, is, as we said before, this sense of competition. Now, this, there's a distinction between, and I don't want to go into too much um, detail on this, there's a distinction between the context with which competition arises. So I want to be clear on this. This part's a little bit deeper, but competition, as we've seen in this lecture series, is key, irrespective of where you live in the world. How competition manifests itself within the national identity varies based on the context of national identity. And we have basically two contexts, right? We have two, two contexts for oops, national Our socialization takes into account the two contexts of our national identity. The first context is a high context. The next context, B, is a low context. A high context national identity socializes for, so this is very technical now, right? So I'm going to say this slow. A high context, because it seems, it's intuitive to me, but I, I want to slow down. A high con and I'll explain this in a bit. A high context national identity socializes for collective behavior. This is a generalization, but this is generally true, right? So that a high context national identity socializes for collective, C-O-L-L-E-C-T. It socializes for collective group behavior, group dynamics, group behavior, collective identity, blah, blah, blah. This is a generalization. There are exceptions to this, but, and I'll explain what all this means in a little bit, because this is definitely, I, I recognize that this is not intuitive. And it's also not in the notes, but, you know, I'm not going to write everything down. Um, number two, a low context, a low context for national identity socializes for individualistic behavior. Okay, so low context, a low national context socializes for individualistic behavior, high national context socializes for collective behavior. The process of socialization is, if you think, if you think of it this already, and there's a philosophical concept for this, it's called always already. So I, I guess I should write this down. A-L-W-A-Y-S-A-L-R-E-A-D-Y. It's always already. And the way that this looks, and I might do this in another series, we have sort of the national We have the national context that exists as such. Imagine that I'm born, right? This is before I'm born, this is after I'm born. We are born into, we are born into these national contexts. And the, the context in which the nation is framed socializes individual people to that national context. So what in the world does this mean? And I apologize, just bear with me. Some of you already know what this means and you know what I'm saying makes sense. For those of you who are just being exposed to this for the first time, I apologize. I'm going to explain what this means now. The context pertains to 
the level of abstraction needed to understand any given statement. So let me give you um, let me give you a very low context statement. Right? A low context statement might be, please go to Publix on the corner of X and Y and purchase a half gallon of 2% milk. <laughs> There's no abstraction that's needed to understand that. There's no additional information that's needed other than what I just said. There's no social cues or social context needed. It's not metaphorical, it's not allegorical, right? That's the key. Low context language is not metaphorical, for all practical purposes, barring a few exceptions. It's not metaphorical, it's not allegorical. Go to this location at this location and purchase this specific product. You know exactly what you need to do. High context refers to the amount of abstraction, allegory, narrative, historical narrative needed to understand a specific statement. So a high context um, statement might be, um, um, what, how do you go? One stone killed two birds. One stone killed two birds. We have this, right? I threw one stone and killed two birds. What does that mean? I threw one stone and killed two birds? You can't really understand the significance, and I'm not going to go into the semiotics of this, but you can't understand really the signification of that statement without first contextualizing that statement within a broader social narrative, within a broader historical narrative. It has historical, socio-historical significance, and it's only with respect to that significance that you can have an understanding. So that if you're a member of a high-context culture, right, if you're a member of a high-context culture, for example, Chinese culture, um, or many of the um, Islamic cultures, if you're a member of a high-context high culture, much of the narrative, the statements, the way in which epistemically information is conveyed within the marketplace of ideas, this isn't to generalize, right, but much of this, and this isn't my saying, I mean, this is, there's a ton of research on this, is contextualized within a discourse that requires um, a rather profound understanding of more than just the statement. The statements themselves refer to other aspects of the social context, the religious context, the political context, and the language, I don't want to say the language becomes metaphorical or allegorical because it sounds pejorative, but in a sense, the language is itself, the day-to-day -day mundane conversational language retains a very, very allegorical, metaphorical um, undertone, and to have a full appreciation, you can't just translate verbatim the words that are being said, because the words that are being said are themselves reference to more complex social structures. In a very low context culture, you don't need all of that um, referential information because it's very directive speech. It's very directed. I need you to do X. Go here and do that. You can see that low context language works very, very, and this is key, and this is absolutely key in our socialization. I didn't put an asterisk by this because it's not in the notes because I didn't want to put it in the notes. Put a key, put a star by this. In an individualistic culture, in an individualistic culture, low context language is an absolutely effective way for securing efficiency, for getting stuff done. Jason, I need you to do X, Y, Z, at this and this, your deadline is that. Because you're speaking to one person, right? Insofar as you're speaking to one person, whoever that person might be, it's a very directive speech, not directed, directive, like Eva and Wally, directive it's a very directive speech. In a high context um, culture, we're talking to a group of people, if you think of it in this way. I'm sort of you know, generalizing this quite a bit so that you can understand. We're talking to a group of people, and if I want to sway a group of people, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to talk about our traditions. I'm going to talk about our history. I'm going to talk about our lineage. I'm going to talk about us collectively. We are the people of the da 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 from the da 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 who believe in da 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 da. 
all of which is, again, not pejoratively, allegorical, metaphorical, associational. Why? Because I'm better able to sway massive swathes of the population with more metaphorical, allegorical language than I am to sway massive um, portions of the population with very directive language. Right? So that's the context. And our socialization is such. So that in the United States, since my view, I mean, I mean, my, my, my viewers are global, but I'll just give the example of the United States. The United States educational system presupposes a low context national identity. Thus, the language of education is very directive. On Friday, class, I need you to write me a four page paper. It needs to include elements A, B, C, D, E. Address this point, critique that point, cite five references. What I do, because I think I'm a good educator, is I try to incorporate a lot of high context in my classes, and I'm telling you as an academic who's been teaching since 2009 that the student population in the United States of America, from my personal experience as a fact, cannot function, cannot function when you speak to them in a high context. This is not to disparage my students. This is not to disparage this institution. It's my personal experience as factually based as an academic. Students, I want you to look on the university website for the last day of the class, which is published for our department. I want you to make sure that you do research on any of these four books that I've assigned for any amount of pages that you want on any topic that you want. Dr. Campbell, I, I, I don't understand. Well, what's the date? I can't do this. I can't. You didn't tell me what you want me to do. No, I, of course I didn't tell you what you, I want you to do because that's low context. You've been socialized. You've been socialized to think only in terms of directives. The United States of America is now within, recognizing we've always been within, we are now within a much more interdependent international community and the rest of the world, huge portions of the rest of the world, don't think and function the way we do. If we, the United States of America citizens, can only think in terms of directives, well, you can imagine what our future is going to look like. We'll be told what to do. Um, I'm pro-USA. I'd rather share. <laughs> um, <coughs> I'd rather share power. I, I, I'm not into the idea that we can't think Low context cultures have an inability to think abstractly, have an inability to be self-sufficient. That's what happens as a consequence, the negative aspect of this. This is important. Why? Because this directly ties into national identity. Remember, we're transitioning slowly from ethnicity into national identity. It probably seems what I'm doing here is easy and intuitive. It's not. Trust me, this is a very hard lecture to give and to keep it in context. But the idea is, if our process of socialization, not even if, since our process of socialization within the United States is such that it facilitates low context um, socialization, it becomes exceedingly important in an international interdependent global community that American students specifically are forced, because you got to force them, to start thinking, thinking in a high context mode of reasoning. Two really different modes of reasoning. If my students, and a lot of them, no disrespect to my students, cannot function, cannot complete a task without me telling them how many words they need to write for this paper, how many pages this paper needs, how many pages does the paper need to be? How many words do I need to have? <laughs> what books do I need to cite? <laughs> Why? No, no, it's the bane of our educational system in the United States because it's automaton. I don't need automatons. I need thinkers. I need critical thinkers. And if everything has to be spelled out, which is where I'm going to have to take my, my pedagogy, um, unfortunately, then I think we are at a huge, huge, huge disadvantage. Not now, but given enough time, we, the United States of America, um, are at an enormous disadvantage because high context thought facilitates abstract thinking, facilitates critical thinking. 
Low context thought, not to say that it doesn't, but low context thought facilitates automation. Do it. Like this. So I got a lot of people who can do exactly what I want them to do, when they want them to do, but you ask them to think outside of the box, you ask them to find information for themselves, to think for themselves, they can't do it. Why? They haven't been socialized to do it. And I'm here to tell you on the front lines that when you try to institute this in education, you get a huge kickback. <laughs> and not in terms of compensation or benefit, you get a huge sort of, tell me what to do. So, I mean, if people want me to tell them what to do, I'll tell them what to do. No problem. All right. So, um, there's, there's more, but I don't want to spend um, sort of more time going into the uh, more technical aspects of it. Two key processes, processes in our socialization. Um, one, education. Two, a recognition of national context. National context is going to inform how we are socialized. The example in the United States is that we are low context. Thus, we are socialized within the low context. What does that mean? Um, unfortunately, we are trained to think inside the box. Everybody loves to talk about thinking outside of the box. I've met very, very, this is not to be elitist, it's a fact. I've met very few people in my life, irrespective of the institutional affiliation that I have, the level of education that I have attained, who actually do think outside of the box. Um, to say that you're thinking out of the side of the box now is also low context, because you've been told, you've been directed to th think outside of the box. I will think outside of the box. That's not how it works. <laughs> That's not thinking outside of the box, right? You've been told, you've been directed. Um, you, it has to be a process that you that you instill within yourself, but that's a whole different, more complicated... Oh, so that's the first thing. So in terms of the process of our socialization, we understand that. How does that contribute to the formation of national identity, right? How does the process of social, which was the second, something like that was the second, how does that contribute to... to how does the process of socialization contribute to our national identification? I, I gave you an insight there. Because it's rooted in the context in which we are born. We don't have any say over where we're born, the, geog the geography in which we're born. We have no say in the ethnicity that we acquire, the gender, the sex, the race that we acquire. Well, gender we do, but it's not sex. Um, well, our national identification is going to be contingent on the process of our socialization. The point is, however, and this is what's key, and I would encourage graduate students to press this issue further and start to do some research on this point. National identification is itself too rigidly defined. It's too inflexible. There's huge changes that are underway via the process of globalization. And if the national identification is we're collective society and you're individualistic or we're individualistic and you're collective, then international cooperation, international interdependence is inhibited by that. It's more beneficial to say, no, we are the United States individualistic, low context culture. Our society is such. But we do have an appreciation and an understanding for collectivist thought. Here's how we've attained this. We've done this because we've recognized that the way in which we think and the way in which we tend to teach ourselves is within very directive, low context. And we've instituted measures to include a more inclusionary, um, high context thought process. And we've done this at the curriculum level. Once we start to do that more, then we can expect change. Because the change starts, in this regard, I absolutely do believe, the, stage, the change starts within the educational system. Now, some people might say it's bottom up, top down, I'm not going to argue about that. It starts within education. For me personally, as an academic, I'm in, sort of imposing this top down. But our students nationally, um, especially at higher ed levels, if our students can't perform simple tasks that require them to find information by themselves and to generate their own work by themselves, if it's only ever going to be a means of them being tasked to do a function, then that translates to they become our political leaders, they become our presidents, they become our governors, they become our sec secretaries of states and our negotiators. And you can imagine what it would be like to sit across from someone like that at the negotiation table. Well, tell me what do you think? Uh, I don't really think anything because I haven't been told a directive. 
I can't take content information and interact with people because I've been haven't been given the task. I mean, it becomes it becomes very very problematic, and it eventually undermines national identity. So that the idea is national identity is facilitated through by the process of our socialization through the context of our society, right? Whether our society is high or low context. So that that gives you. I mean, I've given you probably more than I probably should have, but um, you should have a ton there to flesh through. Um, number four, moving on. Number four. So the final aspect is assimilation. Migrant ethnic communities merge with one uh, merge with other ethnic communities. Assimilation then um, is supposed to be were were it not forced can strengthen a shared national identity. The main difficult uh, the main difficulty to this end, however, is time and is a long process, as it is a long process. The idea is it would be a good research project for graduate students to conceptualize a, me a mechanism that may expedite this process, that is, the process of assimilation inclusion without imposed force. So that the idea is, in terms of the assimilation between communities, it's, it's disparaging to say that you've become nationalized insofar as, and I'm not talking about the nationalization of, I'm a nationalized citizen, I don't mean it in that sense, but to say that, oh, well, Jason, you've been Americanized, right? You're no longer like us, you're like them. That preserves that Americanization, when you say it like that, it, it preserves, it preserves sort of us-them distinction. It preserves an in-out group distinction. The idea is, members of a migrant community who are in the process of assimilating with the host nation need to retain some of their original identity. I mean, I can't speak for the rest of the world, but in the United States, that's encouraged, right? There's a little Havana, there's a little Haiti, there's a little Jamaica, there's a little China, there's a little Korea, there's a there's all over the United States of America, there are pockets of these quote-unquote little communities, and I talked about this before. That's a good thing, right? In the United States, we encourage that. Why? Because it adds, it contributes, those sort of little pockets contributes to the diversity of America as such, the concept of America, not necessarily the geography. It contributes to the, the concept of America. And what is the concept of America? The, the concept of America is, it was a melting pot or a salad, whichever one you want to pick, it doesn't really matter. But the idea is that it is the repository for diverse ethnicities. America is the repository for diverse religions and lack thereof. America is the repository for the world's diversity, right? And insofar as all ethnical identities gain um, footing in American identity, this is important, right? Insofar as all ethnical identities, all ethnical identities gain footing in American identity, national identity is bolstered by that um, interplay between ethnicities. Right, so it is very, very powerful, it's, especially in the 21st century. Right? It's very, very powerful, it's very, very meaningful to have a more inclusionary political um, worldview at the national level. Why? Because diversification of ethnical identities facilitates, contributes to national identity. Where ethnical identities are too conflictual, of course you're going to have to have some, some um, sovereign national regulation, right? You're going to have to have some measures in place to make sure that people are playing fair, to make sure that violence isn't, you know, out of control. There's certain acceptable levels of violence. Why? Because in the end, it is about the preservation of, I mean, to be honest with you, in the end, it's about the preservation of power, right? And where national identity is too strictly forced, is, is too strictly biased on preserving privileges for one ethnical identity over the other, you can rest assured that it's going to um, eventually destabilize and weaken um, any desire to assimilate, right? It, it destabilizes that, that, that desire. No one wants to live in a country where it's known that the country does not accept people of your type. This is really problematic, right? So if you're talking about um, in Europe, in Europe, and I, 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 Gypsy as an ethnical class, I, I, I don't know that I would define Gypsy as an ethnical class per se, but let's just say it, Gypsy as an ethnical class, the, the Gypsy community in Europe is, 
is has a hard time, right? Uh, historically, Jewish community has had a hard time. Um, Pakistani community in Europe as well has a hard time integrating, assimilating with national identity. Why? It's here in the United States. It would probably be Mexican. Um, it's a way. It's, it's, it's a national identity, but the Mexican subgroup of Hispanic, quote unquote, Hispanic ethnicity in America has a hard time integrating with national identity. It's, it's difficult. Everywhere in the world, there are selected pockets of ethnical groups that have a hard time integrating with national identity. In the U.S., it would be um, Mexican-American um, class, Hispanic-American. That specific subgrouping. Um, Mexicans have a very difficult time integrating with national identity. I'm not necessarily sure why. Part of it is certainly, as I said before in the last lecture series, certainly tied to the labor markets and the fact that we've reserved um, that aspect, migrant farming, of the labor market for those of Mexican descent. Um, it, it, as I said in my last lecture, or maybe two lectures ago, it, it, it seemingly excludes Mexican Americans from high innovation and excludes them from higher education and positions that they would otherwise be fully capable of performing. Now, does this inclusionary aspect, does more enticement to assimilate require a change in national consciousness? It absolutely does. You have to first identify that you're doing the practice. Without the identification, it's going to be impossible for you to make accommodations to change. And what it does is it disincentivizes those of partic particular ethnicities from wanting to be affiliated with a national identity, right? And that's, that's a loss to the nation because everybody has something that they can contribute. I mean, I know it sounds hallmarky and sort of hokey, but everybody has uh, something that they can contribute. So I'm going to stop at this point. I have the seven types of uh, assimilation um, left, but I want to make sure that I can cover that. So I'm going to pause and then come back and discuss the seven types of assimilation. Okay, so uh, I want to discuss the seven types of assimilation, and we'll begin with that. All right, so uh, since we understand since we understand assimilation in general, now we want to make distinctions in typology, right, of assimilation. All assimilation assimilation is almost always um, articulated as this. Um, this generalized, sort of homogenous concept, and there are specifications and diversifications in typology with respect to assimilation, and I'm going to talk about you know, the, these distinctions. So seven types of assimilation. Okay, number one, um, cultural assimilation. Some of these I might not write down. Um, cultural assimilation occurs when the values, beliefs, dogmas, ideologies, language, and other systems of symbols, of symbols, system of symbols, I should have underlined that, right? Systems of symbols of the dominant culture are adopted. So the system of symbols, the adoption of the system the adoption of the system of symbols is important, right? So <clears throat> the idea is we have the symbol of Uncle Sam in the United States. And I need to get an Uncle Sam poster from my office. Um, um, we have the symbol of Uncle Sam, authoritative, masculine figure, pointing at you, stern expression, telling you to do something, right? Giving you a command, sort of the father figure, right? That symbol is meaningful in the United States. Some people look at it disparagingly. I'm not telling you how you should interpret the symbol. That's not what's being said in cultural assimilation but it is the incorporation of that symbol to convey some, some meaning. So the use of that symbol to say, to create a meme, right? No matter what the meme says, irrespective of what the meme says, it's sarcastic, it's satirical, it's, it's tongue in cheek. The fact that the symbol is used, the use of the symbol is a form of assimilation. There's a recognition within the community that that symbol is used to 
grab someone's attention to convey meaning, and the use of that symbol is an assimilation of the symbol, right? It's a symbolic assimilation of the symbol. So the idea is you might you might um, be going to a car, something mundane, right? <clears throat> you might go to a car dealership, um, and you see the picture of Uncle Sam, and underneath it says, why pay too much for your car, right? Don't pay too much for your car. It, very, very mundane sort of example. Don't pay too much for your car. People understand it. You recognize that it's an authoritative command from, from a position of power. The car dealership has used the symbol, knowing that you're going to stop and take time to read it because it's Uncle Sam pointing at you. And insofar as you've stopped and he's conveyed the, the, the message, don't pay too much for your next new car, you're thinking to yourself, oh yeah, that's right, next time when I get a new car, I won't pay too much. Well, I've done everything I needed to do because now I've conveyed... <laughs> car dealers, if you make any money off of this, cut me a check, okay? Don't use my ideas and not cut me a check. Cut me a check. You got my address. <laughs> But you get the idea, right? I mean, this is ridiculous, but it's true. So there are many, many symbols that the nation develops um, and that individual cultures themselves develop. And the incorporation and the interplay and the use of these symbols reflect, um, in that sense, something good. In terms of ethnical conflict, however, there are symbols that are bad, right? Very bad. And um, in terms of the system of symbols, the, the one symbolic representation that comes to mind, and I do empathize with this ethnical group a bit, um, is the um, uh, Italian-American ethnical group in the United States. As soon as I say Italian-American in the United States of America, everybody knows, if you're American watching this video, the symbol that is inextricably bound to Italian-American, unfortunately, Italian-American Italian identity. And it's mafia, right? It's gangster. It's corrupt. It's deviant. It's prohibition error. It's recklessness. It's it's Gandolfini and it's his identity as a character, as an actor. It's it's you know Capone. It's that, right? So the idea, and they have anti-defamation leagues um, that are specifically built to change the national identity of Italian Americans. Right? No, Italian Americans aren't, they use the word Guido disparagingly. Um, so, no, they're not all Guidos, right? No, you have Italian Americans who have done huge contributions to American national identity. The question is, can you name a few of them? Do you know any Italian Americans that have contributed to America's national identity for the good? Aside from, you know, uh, I forget the names, the Jersey Shore people? Or aside from the Godfather series, um, it's important that we do. It's important that we are inculcated with that, with that significance, with that meaning. So, for example, in the United, this is weird. It's, it seems like it's tangential, but it's not in terms of cultural assimilation. Just like we have incorporated Jewish history in our academic um, matriculation in African American history in our academic matriculation. It's important that we include diverse communities, Hispanic, Italian, such that every time I think about Hispanic communities, I'm not thinking about um, immigrants and beggars, and I, uh, that's disparaging. Every time I think about Italians, I'm not thinking about mafia and, and death and, you know, the Godfather series. No, I, I can, no, there is there are members of the Italian American, there are enormous segments, the vast majority of the Italian, Italian American community that are, you know, law abiding, good citizens that make contributions to this nation. It's important to make sure that incorporating these systems of symbols for good, like, we, like I said with Uncle Sam, in terms of just telling you something, or bad, in terms of the defamation of an Italian identity, that we have a recognition of this. Why? Because you ought not to defame. Italian identity. Italians, Italian Americans are more than just gangsters, right? Than how they are portrayed in the movies and such. All right. Number two, uh, structural assimilation. Now here's a quote: Structural assimilation occurs when migrant ethnic groups become members of the primary group within dominant ethnic subpopulations. However, it is more difficult to achieve than cultural assimilation because it involves penetration into the close interactions and association 
of dominant ethnic groups. So that the idea is, the idea might be, uh, and there's a lot written on this, part of the concept is there's a literature known as passing. So you could read up on passing. Um, in terms of civil rights era, passing might be reserved for those mulatto men and women that could pass, quote unquote, as white. In South Florida, since I live here, um, and I know this because I've seen this, so this, you know, this, I'm not trying to generalize and I'm not trying to disparage, this is a fact. South Florida um, members, some members of Cuban, but primarily members of Argentinian um, national identity living in South Florida might be able to quote unquote pass as white. This idea of structural assimilation is the ability for members of other national or primarily in the context of this lecture, ethnical identities being able to quote unquote pass as white since white in the United States is the dominant ethnical identity. Dominant albeit never stated ethnical identity because you never really say white in the United States, you just say American. So if you're able to pass, I, I clearly I would fail the passing skin test, <laughs> but if you're able to pass as white, then you gain the benefits of passing as white. And there's a lot of, so of consolidated structural assimilation into the phrase passing. Why? Because there's tons and tons of research that have gone into passing. I've myself included passing, but I took it a step further than just sort of the skin test. And I talked about this in my, my lecture on uh, gender essentialism. And this would be transgendered individuals who are able to pass, quote unquote, as the other gender. So um, female to male, that passes male. They look as male, you would never think they're male. Or male to female, that passes female, you would never know that they were men. So I, I took it, obviously, I took this a lot further in terms of structural assimilation and pushed it to passing in terms of gender. Since gender is socially constructed, um, here are instances in which I can demonstrate and prove that passing structural assimilation is possible by pointing to a male to female uh, transsexual who you would absolutely believe is a woman. Only if you were to you know, test his blood or her, blo her blood would you identify that no, genetically, she is quote unquote a man or male. Um, so passing is much broader. This concept of passing is much deeper, much broader than just sort of the skin test. You can actually pass in terms of gender. Obviously, heterosexual normativity being the gender which is being challenged by transsexualism. And again, I've written on that um, elsewhere. Um, uh, marital assimilation, right? The emergence of high rates of intermarriage between migrant and dominant ethnic groups, right? Marital assimilation, there was a time in which, uh, believe it or not, in the United States, in many parts of the world, right, uh, most recently South Africa, but there was a time in United States history when it was illegal for a black person to marry a white person, to marry outside of your quote-unquote race. So that intermarital assimilation is a genetic assimilation. It's probably the deepest form of assimilation. Um, why? Because it's a mixing of genes. Now, personally, I don't get into all this sort of antiquated discussion. We're all human beings. So it's the mixing. Um, the mixing isn't something that I, that I obsess about. I do recognize that there are purity, dispurity discourses that say, you know, whites should be with whites, blacks should be with blacks, Mexicans should be with Mexicans, and on and on and on. But the, arguably, the greatest form of assimilation is um, genetic assimilation that is itself a consequence of marital assimilation. So marital, number four, um, identification assimilation, no longer sees themselves as distinctive. That is, their, their exoticism, or their exoticism is lost, relinquished, right? You no longer see yourself as being distinctive, right? You are part of the fabric of the community. You and your ethnic group is part of the fabric of the community so that um, there might be some distinctiveness preserved, but for all practical purposes, you function day to day as a member of the national identity. Your ethnic identity is there, but your ethnic identity has been 
to a large extent subsumed. For some ethnic groups, this is easier than others, right? Again, for <clears throat> for Italian Americans, it I would say, and I don't know that this is a fact. Um, this would make good academic research. I don't know how you would quantify this, but um, identity integration, right? This idea of identification assimilation, I would say, is a little bit harder for Italian Americans than it might be for Irish Americans for any number of reasons. But primarily, it's harder for Italian Americans. And again, I don't know that this is the case. This would be a good study to see if this is true. But it, arguably, it might be harder for Italian Americans to integrate fully with American national identity than Irish Americans, specifically because of the symbolic integration of mafia. So there's a reluctance a bit, right, to, to fully identify Italian Americans with American national identity for any number of reasons, right? Obviously, it's going to be much, much difficult for those of us who obviously, well, you can see, well, I'm black, right? Jamaican identity, more difficult. Haitian identity, more difficult, right? So that the skin test might be the first test, the ethnical relationship and the ability to adapt and absorb that ethnical identity into national identity is ultimately going to be um, a sense of inclusion, a feeling. It's a feeling. Do I feel included? For me personally, I do. Right? I can't speak for everybody else in the population. I'm not talking about all blacks. But for me, I definitely do feel included. I don't think I would have this feeling if I didn't have the credentials I have. So I feel included because I'm smart, because I've contributed. My inclusion is facilitated by education. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is I do I do personally feel included. I can't speak for everybody else, I'm just speaking for myself. So that's number four. I'm not gonna write that. Alright, so ID number five. Um, attitude or receptional assimilation. The lack of prejudicial attitudes and stereotypes on the part of both dominant and migrant ethnic groups. This is a bit ideal, to be honest with you. Um, this operationally functional, eh, I'm not really sure if I can I mean lack of prejudicial prejudicial attitudes and stereotypes on the part of both dominant I don't know that I agree with this as an existent phenomenon. Sure, we might be able to localize that, but even as a Jamaican, there are prejudicial Jamaican. Oh, well, you know, all Jamaicans smoke weed and all Jamaicans love Bob Marley. It's funny on a side note, I probably shouldn't share this, but um, members of my family and I sort of have had equally, you know, like we love Bob. Bob is the greatest, but it's like, okay, we listen to other stuff too, right? It's not just about Bob Marley, <laughs> right? Jamaicans aren't just about Bob Marley. We listen to all types of music. This sort of insignificant comment, but lack of prejudice, eh, there's always going to be some sense of prejudice, and stereotypes, eh, there's always going to be some stereotyping, but I, I do understand, you feel received, right, receptionality, right, this, the, the sense of receptional appreciation, the sense of reciprocity is probably a better word here, um, and I do feel, and I, I think members, individual members of ethnical groups do feel a sense of reciprocity with their national identity, because despite the fact that I migrated here, I, I do feel, and I do consider myself um, an American. Granted, I was born in Jamaica, I will always be Jamaican, but I consider myself, I identify myself nationally as an American, right? Um, so that's that. Number six, behavioral receptional assimilation, and here's a quote. The absence of intentional discrimination by dominant ethnic groups against subordinate ethnic prop populations. Again, more of an ideal. The idea of the absence should be in sort of quotes. Um, maybe a diminution might be better. Maybe an, in, uh, an attenuated level, a tenuous level of um, discrimination. But the absence of discrimination, I think, is a bit uh, too far, personally. This is what the author's saying, but, you know, it's my series, so I'm going to challenge the author on, on some concepts. So, but you get the idea. The idea is a sense of inclusion is facilitated by, what's the point, um, this behavioral receptivity, right? You've been, in, you've been allowed to be who you are. For me personally, I have problems with that because it's sort of the allowing it has a very sort of paternalistic undertone to it that I don't particularly like. And then lastly, number seven, I'm not going to write the rest of these up, um, let me erase it. And then lastly, number seven. Um, is civic assimilation, which is critical. 
which is why it's moral. The reduction of conflict between inter-ethnic groups over basic values and access to the political arena. Right? In the United States, we have a very, very inclusive political process. There are representations at the state level, in the military, in government, in the judiciary, of any number of ethnical populations. There's also um, diverse sexual orientation representation, right? There's representation in terms of various sexuality at these levels. And that <coughs> civic assimilation allows for policy, which is the key, right? It allows for policy to be inclusive. If those who are making policy aren't themselves representing marginalized community, they're not going to be able to make empathic political decisions. Policy making becomes apathetic. In order to have sympathetic or even empathetic policy, policy makers need to live it. You need to experience it. You need to embody it. You need to understand it. And thus, when it's time to make formal decisions, um, you, can, you can do so to the advantage of those, these advantages, right? This is, uh, I have it up here somewhere. This is, um, I have it right here. This is Rawls. This is uh, Rawls' Theory of Justice 2.0, really. Great book. Um, it's it's Rawlsian. I wouldn't say it's Rawls specifically, but it's Rawlsian, which is not just making decisions on those who are least advantaged, because that presupposes their non-participation in the political process. It also presupposes some paternalistic sentiment. But I mean, not to disparage Rawls, his intentions were just and good. The idea is, don't make the decision for me and for my kind. Have me there to make the decision, right? Have me physically represented at the decision table so that I can make a decision on behalf of, quote unquote, my people, um, which creates a sense of ownership in the political process. And policy making is undeniably about political ownership. I have ownership over this policy because that policy reflects the sentiments of my community, of your community, and thus it hopefully it hopefully facilitates the function of governance better. All right. So um, the last bit: basic structures of pluralistic ethnical theories. So the structure, the basic structures. One: um, when identity is nurtured, a pluralistic and permanent mosaic. I like that, right? The mosaic sort of tiles. Um, when identity is nurtured, a pluralistic and permanent mosaic of ethnic subpopulations becomes evident. And the idea of the mosaic is great, right? If you look at the mosaic close, closely, you see each individual tile. And they're colored and they're segmented and organized in particular ways. But when you stand back, right, when you stand back, you get to see the, the entire picture. So that the mosaic is a good segue into, we're going to go very gradually, but a good segue into this idea of the transformation from ethnical into national identity, because each particular piece of the mosaic represents ethnical identity. Whereas the collection of all the pieces, and all of this is a mosaic, is national. So the national is the composite mosaic, and each individual piece of that composite mosaic is constituted by individual tiles. Each individual tile is representative of ethnical subgroupings, and that's how you see the interplay, right? It's a good sort of allegorical, high context, it's a good allegorical means of making sense of this interplay between, um, <laughs> this interplay between uh, ethnicity and nationality. So 1A. This is easy to agree with theoretically with an American with an American ethnical subpopulation. What would it mean for white identity? Talk, I'll talk about this in my race series. You'll just have to watch that as well. Are people receptive to nurturing white identity? If not, why? Part of the ethnical grouping in the United States is white identity. Granted, it's never disclosed and it's primarily not disclosed because of privilege. But I'm the type of scholar. I refuse to believe that because, undeniably, because there is white privilege, white privilege is a fact in American 
national identity, that because there's white privilege, um, that privilege forfeits an ability to talk about pride, or forfeits an ability, a pride independent to, I don't mean white pride in terms of how it's typically construed, right, in terms of domination or violence or anti, anti-Semitic, not that, just pride in one's ethnical identity. Why isn't that a possibility in the United States? Well, it's not a possibility because of privilege. But the question is, is that fair? Right? Most, I think, um, African American theorists might say, yes, it's a consequence of privilege. It's one of the bad side effects of privilege is that you don't get to have pride. Um, I think that's up for debate. I think it would be a very interesting debate to see the justification for that. Why is it that privilege then um, presupposes that ethnical identity of a privileged class forfeits pride? Mm. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd be, I'm, I'm open to being swayed. 1B, there's a logical inconsistency to both agree with this statement while also denying its importance for the dominant ethnical groups. And the idea is if we're talking about individual tiles of the mosaic contributing to national identity, wherein individual tiles are ethnical, then undeniably there is an ethnical identity that contributes to the national identity that is the dominant ethnical group, which is white. Well, there should be some recognition of the contribution to national identity, just like there is Jamaican, just like there is Haitian and Korean and, you know, you name it. Um, if you say no, that there shouldn't be that pride in contribution, I would need to hear a justification for why not. Granted, almost exclusively, any time you hear about, I, I can't even think of a time where I've heard about um, ethnical white quote-unquote pride without it being anti-Semitic, racist, but I believe that there, at least conceptually, there should be, there should be a way of being proud of being white without it being so pejorative, right, without it being so violent. Uh, it is the case that it, it is almost exclusively always that way, um, partly because maybe of privilege in a um, an inability to recognize privilege, but I don't think that that's inherent. I don't think it's inherently the case. There has to be a way in which one could express pride of one's ethnicity like any other ethnic group without that it necessitating inherently domination and subordination. I'm not going to go into that too much more than that. Number two, um, inter-ethnic segmentary conflict resolution, mitigation, identification, becomes a um, national priority where ethnical identity is incommensurable with competing ethnic identity. There's going to be conflict. Blacks versus whites, blacks versus blacks. Well, I'm saying inter-ethnic here, not intra. So blacks versus whites, blacks versus Hispanics, Hispanics versus whites, whites versus Koreans, Koreans versus, and on and on and on. Native Americans versus, da -da -da -da. Native Americans versus whites, right? Um, there are going to be certain levels of violence, inter-ethnic violence. I don't personally believe there will ever be a time, even conceptually, where there won't be any violence. So there, there are acceptable levels of violence. There are acceptable levels of hostility and casualties that have to be factored into rationally, realistically, into any sort of governance approach. What that number might be is irrele irrelevant here. But the idea is the national identity has to take that into account and attempt to mitigate and... and Keep in check levels of violence. I think the effort on a national level to completely eradicate inter-ethnic violence, albeit a good intention, is, is profoundly unrealistic and a waste of time and a waste of resources, personally. Now, that might be too pessimistic for some, but that's my own, that's my own sort of belief. And then lastly, number three, under basic structures of pluralistic ethnical theories, Lastly, it's necessary for unified national identity, which ideally subsumes ethnical rivalries. The idea is that we take the idea is that we take um, our national identity and we place emphasis on our national identity. It's not that your ethnic ethnicity isn't important. Ethnicity is important, but it's about being American. It's about being whatever your nation is, right? 
Here, it's American identity. So yeah, you might be Black American, White American, Hispanic American, Native American, Asian American, da da da. But it's about that identity as constituted within the nation, right? The problem is, however, right? And I'm I'm, I'm very patriotic, but the problem is, however, that our language, and I'll talk about this in my race series, not in this series. Our language preserves our ethnical identity. But for white Americans, it doesn't. Because white Americans is only ever used in sort of pedagogical discourse. It's never used culturally. So if American presupposes whiteness, and I have to classify myself by saying I'm black American or African American, then that, within national identity, that preserves... Um, difference within national identity. Now, is it the end of the world? No, it's not the end of the world. Let's keep it real. <laughs> Let's keep it real. It's not the end of the world. Is it a difficult thing that we have to overcome? Yes. Why is it difficult? Because it's sociolinguistic. It's in our language. It's in the way in which we speak, and as I said in the last series, anytime we have a procedure for discrimination, anytime we have a thought process, a sociolinguistic structure that normalizes um, discriminatory language, that's what the practice is going to be. The fact that we still have hyphenated Americans, and we don't just talk about Americans as a consequence of news reporting and pundits, as a consequence of our media, as a consequence of just daily interaction, means that we are going to have segmentations of identity within our national identity. Could the nation be potentially stronger were we to relieve ourselves of this sort of antiquated ethnical association? Possibly. I would imagine, yes, it would. Will that day happen? It might. Should we work for that? Sure, we should. In the meantime, however, um, it's up to the individual. If you allow that fact to justify your resentment for that sort of exclusion, that's your problem. That's on you. I don't. Okay, Jason, so you're a black American and not fully American. Well, I mean... Is that a problem for you? Well, is that a problem for you? I, it's, not help, it's not hampering me in any sense. It's up to the individual. It's your responsibility to identify who you are with respect to your national and ethnical affiliation. You determine where you put the emphasis. No one else does. So I put the emphasis on the latter part of my ethnical national identification, American. Right? Um... Some people say, no, Jason, you're definitely more black than you are American. Well, that's how you see me. <laughs> how I see me is I'm more American than I am black. I don't even really know what it means to be black. It's this. That doesn't factor into my daily life at all. I don't ever think about me being black. I always think about me being an American, though. Right? So it, it's important to make sure that you take the responsibility to define yourself. Whatever anybody else does is on them. But in terms of self-identification... If you put the ownership on your ethnicity, fine. If you put the, uh, the ownership on your national, national identity, fine. If you put ownership on both, fine. But make that clear so that other people uh, can recognize um, who it is that you are. They can have a better understanding. So with that, um, I want to thank you for watching my videos. This concludes section 1.4. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.